Hey everybody, welcome to One More Round with Josh Norris. I'm stoked, I got my buddy Ishmael Martinez with me uh, today. Uh, he's an entrepreneur, he's the founder of Panda Pest Control and Zebra Cleaning. Um, and today we're just gonna talk about business, the good, bad, and the ugly. And welcome, thanks well, for coming thank on today. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, so you, you got two companies and in multiple states. How, how did you get into to all this? So my background, I, um, I'm originally from Mexico, born and raised in Mexico. Um, I had the opportunity to do some um, service for my church for two years in uh, New York City. Cool. So that was pretty much my first step into coming to America. Mm -hmm. That's where I learned English. And when I go back from uh, that service and I uh, started school here in Arizona, a friend of mine uh, introduced me to work doing sales for a pest control company. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got started in, in, in service company. So that was my very first, uh, well, my second job in the U.S. I used to sell pest control uh, services door to door. Wow. So I did that for about 10 years. Uh, the last couple years, I, I was a partner with that company. And we opened up a, 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 a market in Seattle. Mm -hmm. But then about half of that career, I was a sales manager. So I was in charge of um, recruiting, training managing sales reps okay so we will put out you know sell accounts and you know generate nearly a million dollars to over a million dollars uh per year for pest control accounts which is it's interesting to think that killing bugs can make millions of dollars right, right. so um then when i parted ways with that company i had a pretty harsh non-compete so i uh i left seattle i left utah which that that's where that company is headquartered and um, my family and i relocated to arizona and while that uh, non-compete was up, I, I started a cleaning company. It seemed like everybody needs cleaning, so yeah, it seemed like the right thing. What, what made you choose Arizona? So my wife is from Arizona, okay. and then my uh, my family lives really close to, to here. It's, it's about a six-hour drive from here to my hometown in Mexico. Oh, cool. So geographically, it's just a good place for us. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. So what was it like doing door-to-door -door sales? I mean, I, that's, I think well, a lot of people would dread doing that, but you, yeah. every time I've heard you talk about that side of your life, it seems like you enjoyed it. I think um, I wouldn't have the knowledge, the experience, and um, a lot of the ambition that I have now uh, if I didn't do door-to-door -door sales. Yeah. I feel like in the first couple of years, it gave me decades of business perspective and business experience just by getting rejected eight to 10 hours a day, being told no way more times than I got told yes. Uh, working, I mean, my first year doing that job, I was working in Austin, Texas. Okay. Um, uh, to this day, uh, 2011 stands as the hottest summer in the history of Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. It was 110 days over 100 degrees, and that's where I was knocking doors. Yeah. In the middle of the summer, so it really did taught me a lot of hard work, a lot of persistence, a lot of patience. Um, and for me being, I mean, I didn't really speak good English back then. I don't think I speak good English right now, but, but back then I was definitely not good at it. It just taught me to be confident and to just put a big smile and, and mm -hmm. you know, just to try hard. Do you remember your first sale in uh, oh, Pest Control? Would I? Yeah. yeah. Ne I will never forget it. Yeah. Tell me uh, and I'll tell you, because that's a funny story. So uh, I think most of the states, they have this small bug called a silverfish. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen it or if you know what it looks like. I do, yeah. It's like a gray uh, bug. So I had been knocking doors for about 10 hours. It was dark. It was 9.30, 9.45 p.m. And I was like, okay, one, one more round. One more house, yep. right? So I went and knocked one last house, and the lady comes up, and the second I said pest control, she asked me, hey, do you take care of silverfish? I've never heard that term before. So you said yes. I no, so I said, no, we don't take care of fish. Oh. Because oh. in my mind, there's goldfish. Yeah. And then there's also silverfish. Mm -hmm. And I, I figure maybe there's also uh, bronzefish and blackfish. I don't know. Yeah. So she just said, uh, do you take care of silverfish? I have a lot of that. Yeah. And I just back off. And I was like, no, sorry. We only take care of bugs. Mm -hmm. And she's like, oh, yeah. But uh, so do you take care of silverfish? And I just couldn't understand. So I thought, no, we, we don't do that. Um, we can do spiders and the ants and the scorpions. But no, I, I can't help you with the fish. And she's like, okay, well, that's weird. So then I left and I met up with my, uh, my friend who was my manager. He gave me a ride to, to the area. He would pretty much drop me off in the neighborhood all day. So he picked me up and he asked me, how did it go? And I was like, yeah, it was, really, it was a really good day. I learned a lot. It was, it was rough. But there was this crazy lady at the end that she wanted me to kill her fish. And she's like, what do you mean her fish? Like, yeah, she, that she had like a bunch of silverfish that she wanted me to kill. And he's like, dude. And he pulled out like a picture on his phone. Like, that's what the silverfish is. 
So it was like 10.30 p.m. She was probably going to bed, and I went back and knocked on her door. And I was like, hey, I'm sorry. I don't speak good English. Uh, but, yeah, we do take care of the silverfish. We can have somebody out here to help you. So that was the first sale. Wow. Like 10 30 p.m. <laughs> I love that, man. It, it, it's, it's crazy. Everybody I know that's in sales, including myself, you can always remember that first yeah. one because it was like a game changer. You know what I'm saying? Um, so you, you get into to sales, pest control. You, you actually have, it's pretty lucrative at this point when you're a partner. Mm-hmm. Then you leave that company and you go into a cleaning business down here. What, what, so what made you get into to cleaning uh, from pest control? Um, so I did door to door sales, uh, pest control sales for about 10 years. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I noticed is that um, most of my clientele or my demographic was middle upper class. So a lot of them, people that are, were willing to buy pest control, they also bought other services. Mm-hmm. And I started to notice that every time I was uh, selling, advertising, soliciting for pest control services, I would see uh, in the same neighborhoods uh, trucks for pool cleaning companies mm-hmm. and AC repairmen and uh, carpet cleaning guys and also home cleaners. Mm-hmm. So over time, as my ambition and my understanding of business started to grow, I started asking all my clients, hey, besides pest control, what other services do you pay for? And some of them will pay for uh, pest control, pool cleaning, and home cleaning. Some other people will pay for uh, pest control, window cleaning, and home cleaning. Another customer will pay for pest control, carpet cleaning, and home cleaning. But the one thing that they all had in common, especially the upper end homes, is they all had home cleaning. Mm-hmm. I feel like there is, just like maybe you and I or a lot of people, you get to a point in life to where you no longer wash your car. Yeah. You just take it to the car wash. Mm-hmm. I think there is a, a very um, good chunk of the population that once they reach a threshold of, of being busy or of uh, financial freedom, cleaning their house is just something they don't do. Yeah. So I started to realize that that was a very lucrative. And then as I did some of my research, the competition was pretty weak. What, what do you mean? Like, what, what, what did you see in the competition that was weak? I, I always say this, and, and I don't know if it's the, the full truth of this, but I, this is how I sorted the cleaning industry. You have pretty much three big segments. Mm-hmm. You have about 80% of the cleaning industry, which is your, your independent cleaners. Mm-hmm. Right? The lady that your sister recommended, that she's been cleaning for 10 years. Mm-hmm. It's just the one lady has like three or four clients, and that's all she does, right? Mm-hmm. That's about 80% of the industry. And then you have a small percentage, 1% to 5% of the industry, is your big names, your Molly Mates, Mary Mates, Cleaning Authority, Two Mates and a Mop, mm-hmm. all of these big, big companies. They're franchises and they're so dominant uh, throughout the country. And then you have about a 15 to 20 percent of the industry, which is companies like me. Mm-hmm. The companies where the owner is no longer a cleaner, mm-hmm. uh, they have some sort of mid level management, and then they have a good force of uh, of, of team members, of staff members that go out and actually perform the cleaning services. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the problem with the, the largest chunk, which is uh, the independent cleaners, they're not very good at business. They don't understand accounting. They don't understand uh, the cost of product. They don't understand technology. They don't do very good invoicing. Their marketing is not on point. Mm-hmm. They don't carry an insurance. Uh, they don't wear a uniform. They're very unreliable. Mm-hmm. But then on the flip side, uh, big companies like Molly Mates, Mary Mates, Cleaning Authority, they have thousands, tens of thousands of customers mm-hmm. that uh, every customer pretty much becomes irrelevant. Mm-hmm. Because as one customer walks out the door, three are walking in the door, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so then I feel like we, we had that great opportunity to be a little more creative, to implement some marketing, some branding, which is a, a, a big chunk of our business, our marketing, our branding, our advertising, our social media presence. And then we were able to fine tune a couple of things that the industry was missing. Mm-hmm. So how, where'd you get your business acumen? I mean, were you always kind of like this, or did you start reading, have some mentorship? No, I, so both mom and dad are teachers in Mexico. Okay. Uh, my mom actually just so proudly, the other day sent me a message. She hit her 50th anniversary as a teacher. Wow. Um, so she's been working from every level, from elementary school up to college. Uh, my dad is a teacher as well. Uncles, cousins, grandparents are all teachers. Mm-hmm. So I grew up with a solid foundation on the importance of education. When I came to the U.S., uh, I initially wanted to be a police officer. Okay. I don't think I have the guts to be a police officer, so I, I turned that down very quickly. I'm like, yeah, sounds like a good idea, but not, not really. And I went to school for business, and my dream was to be in the marketing side of things. I, I wanted to, to do advertising, to consult for other companies. And as soon as I graduated, I landed a really good job uh, with a company up in Salt Lake City, and uh, I thought it was everything I've ever dreamed of. 
I showed up my first day with a suit, with a tie. I had a really nice office. Um, you can say it was like a big deal because we were with a pretty capable team and we had a big budget and it just seemed like everything was awesome. Mm -hmm. I had a one year contract at month five. I just, um, I hate this place. I hate it so much. Yeah. I hate everything about it. I hate sitting here for eight hours. I hate being told what to do. I hate that I'm like caged on this. You know, I have like four uh, pretty small square where I have to stay within those lines. So yeah, I decided to go back to selling, to knocking doors, to talking to people, to being able to make as much money and as many sales as I wanted to in a day. Mm -hmm. And also have the freedom that if one day I, I wanted to take a, a break and, and take some time for myself, I can just have that freedom. So yeah, that's where I, I think my my desire for business and, and the entrepreneurship life came from. Okay. And what, what's helped you um, be successful in these companies? Like, uh, do you, ha you have a mentorship in things now? Because I know we met in Arte and that's probably yeah. something, but... Well, first of all, I always like to be very cautious, right? I don't know if I'll call myself successful, right? Because just as I've been, uh, we've done a couple of things good. Uh, there is a million things in business and also in my personal life that I have so much work to do. Sure. Uh, but I think one of the things that is giving me some longevity and just allow me to keep going is, uh, yeah, mentorship, definitely. I have a, between books, uh, people that I know, and then our mentorship groups like Arete, um, I mean, a couple other uh, groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think just the experience of others, the mistakes of others, um, words of wisdom, words of uh, caution mm -hmm. have been very important to me. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of it has been just taking the, uh, the leap of faith to do something and, and figuring out that it was wrong and then just having to go back and fix it. And, and I think trial and error experience has been a great teacher for me. What's been some of the hardest things being in business for yourself? I think just being able to lead. Okay. When, when, I, when I worked at that company, I was a, a pretty well-established leader, but I had so many resources, right? I had a, a, a nice office. I had a brand behind me. Mm -hmm. I had other upper-level management behind me. Um, I had a reputation that I had built over 10 years. And when I got here, I thought I could just like copy-paste that into what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And I realized that it was just, it was not that easy because chaos started to come to me, financial chaos. We didn't have, we were not making any money. We started right before COVID. So as soon as we started to make money, we just lost all of our customers. So that panic, I was not um, capable at a time to manage that chaos and that stress. So I would just pass that on to my team and team members and employees started to quit and leave. They didn't want to be around me. I wasn't. Yeah, I don't, I don't blame them. I wouldn't want to be around me either, right? Yeah. So I, I think that was probably one of the most challenging pieces. Just learn how to be the right type of leader in the right type of environment at the right moment. Because mm -hmm. that has to change, right? Sometimes yeah. I had to be hardcore. Sometimes I had to go all the way to love and, and understanding. Some days it's a give or take. So I, I think that's been probably the most challenging piece for me to mm -hmm. just um, be able to adapt to what my team needs. I like that a lot, actually. Uh, are there any like books that, that helped you with some of this or help discover? Oh, gosh, I have so many books that, are, that have been great for me. Um, Traction is a great book. I love that book. Yeah, I think a lot of uh, good business owners uh, mm -hmm. like it a lot. Um, I like that one, Leadership and Self-Deception. Uh, the Go-Giver is a good book. Mm -hmm. um, I actually had a chance to meet Bob Berg. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I, it's actually an interesting story. So about 12 years ago, we had, he had done an event in Ahwatukee, and we sponsored oh, cool. it. Oh, cool. And um, what was really neat about it was I had never met the guy, but I had read The Go-Giver, and uh, he was going to give a talk that day. And he had introduced himself to about 50 people before he got up there and, and spoke. And he said, hey, if I, if I met you, go ahead and stand up. And so everybody that he had met that morning he stood up. He said, I'm going to tell you your first name and then sit down. Nobody had name tags on, by the way. Mm -hmm. And he goes through 50 people and gets every name correct. And it was insane because he it was so intentful on remembering people. And that's something that he did actually teach later that day. But I'll never forget that little exercise because it was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Did, well, that's, um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's a good book. Mm -hmm. And I think he teaches great principles. So that's helped me a lot. Uh, and I mean, I have, I think I got into this uh, stage on our business where I was panicking. Mm -hmm. We went to where we were making money, but we were, we were always just literally one week or one mistake or one day away from either we hit a home run 
or we're going to be in a lot of trouble. I think yeah. that's we, we started to buy vehicles. We started to we lease an office. We, I got more uh, admin team. So we were running like the numbers had to be perfectly calculated. Either you know it was a home run or we it was going to be bad. Yeah. And I got in this like panic moment where I was like, okay, I need to know everything I can know. So I started buying books, reading books. I would listen to two podcasts per day, read a, a book a week. I was just trying to soak in, and I was just panicking, and I was just trying to figure it out. And um, I learned a lot during that time, but I also think my mindset wasn't uh, the best because mm -hmm. I was just in panic mode. Mm -hmm. But now, yeah, I continue to read, and there's a bunch of really good books that I've read. That... So you said, like, when the pandemic hit, like, business dropped off like yeah. crazy, as I'm sure it did for anybody in the home service world mm -hmm. uh, that was internal uh, in the house. Um, how did you turn it around? Like, how did you keep your... I mean, I know you said you panicked, but obviously you made it out of it. How did you turn that around? <laughs> um, That's actually a pretty pretty fun time for me. Um, we had established our home cleaning business. Um, so we had a, I can't remember the number of customers, but we, we had enough to where I had employees and they were doing the work. And then all the employees, uh, either they didn't want to work because they were scared and, or all the customers didn't want that. So I was left me and my right-hand guy. My, my my boy Memo. So it was these two dudes doing home cleaning. Mm -hmm. You usually expect two ladies to come clean your house. It was like this big guy and then me showing up to clean homes. And that's, it was just us two. We didn't have any money. We didn't have any employees. Customers were canceling left and right. And we were desperate just like everybody else. And we had to get super creative. Mm -hmm. uh, we went and, be, and just, this is fun. At the time it used to be a little bit embarrassing, but I just had to do what I had to do. Now I just, I think of it with so much joy. But, um, my clientele is usually people with middle upper class, right? Yeah. So I, I would always try to think, okay, where can I find them? A lot of them. So we started to spot that usually people that have a little bit more money, they shop at Trader Joe's or at Sprouts mm -hmm. for their groceries. So we will go with flyers and we will see it outside of Trader Joe's. Memo will go to Sprouts, we'll go to Trader Joe's mm -hmm. and we will wait. And then as soon as an escalator will roll in, we'll go give them a flyer. Yeah. Hey, do you need your house clean? I'm your guy. And then if a little uh, Civic or a Toyota will roll in, it's like, yeah, no, we'll wait for the Teslas, right? So we were going after, like, the people, and we got so much business just, like, going That's after. That's brilliant. <laughs> it fact, worked like a charm. It was awesome. On uh, Baseline in Guadalupe, there's literally a Trader Joe's next to a Sprouts. Like, that, yeah. that would have been a gold mine. Yeah, time. so we, we were doing that in Queen Creek. That's where I live, so okay. that was close to my house. Um, so it was so fun. And then we made these uh, signs, and we would go in, like, the intersections of the uh, schools or like the dance studios where the rich mom takes uh, their daughters. Mm -hmm. So around six o'clock when they're picking up their kids, like we will go to that intersection with a sign and we will like sign the uh, yeah. dance and just tell people to, to get home cleaning. And yeah, the phone started to ring little by little. We started to get a clientele and it went from uh, using a lot of uh, social media advertising to a lot of like sweat and tears to knock doors, to drop off flyers, to talk to customers in parking lots to literally like dancing with a sign that says, get your house cleaned. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, at the time I remember being a little embarrassed because I, before that I had a great job that paid really well and mm -hmm. had some nice perks and I went to like dancing on the side of the road to get business, <laughs> right? But uh, those were just so valuable lessons and they taught me that I am actually willing to do whatever it takes to help our business yeah. be successful. Yep. And uh, those are some of the most precious memories we have of building our business. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting. Like it takes me back actually to my life in 2000, I think it was 2006. Um, I had uh, had a contract with some health clubs and then they sold, uh, but I had my own business doing that and I went from decent money to no money. So I literally put out 50 applications. I got hired at Target to do night stocking and then I got hired at, at, to be a bre breakfast uh, uh, waiter. Um, at the good egg and I was a terrible waiter by the way <laughs> but I would literally do my night stocking I'd wake up in the morning and I would then go do that for you know six seven hours so I'd work you know 16 hours in a row and it was it was miserable at the time but looking back I'm like yeah no I was gonna win I was gonna do something and then I got hired at Gannett and then that's what kind of helped me understand the media world and I started after like digital in 2008 mm -hmm. but yeah when you look back in times like that it's like no I'm gonna win somehow that's super yeah, and, cool. And I think that's one thing that I learned doing door-to-door -door sales, mm -hmm. that I, I was just, I just needed to keep knocking. Yep. If you keep knocking and talking to people, you'll get a sale. Yeah. And there were days 
gosh, there was days that I remember they were so difficult. They, my brain was just playing games with me, and, and it was so hard mentally and emotionally. And there were other days where I was on top of the world. Like I literally anything that I touched became gold. Yeah. And in, in that roller coaster, I, I had to learn to not ride my highs or my lows, but just to remember the basics. Keep working hard. Mm -hmm. Put your head in the game, uh, be grateful, keep a smile, keep working hard, like be patient, and things just naturally happen. Mm -hmm. And I think when you start a business, you have so many emotions, so many concerns, uh, you're spread so thin, there's so many things that you're juggling that you forget about the basics, like work hard, smile, be good to people, like yeah. just relax a little bit, take your time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, those were good reminders for me. Yeah, it's, it's funny because you, you said that you were gonna, you wanted to be a police officer and you're like, I don't have the guts for that. I'm like, no, bro, you got tons <laughs> of guts. To be an entrepreneur, different types of guts, but no, yeah. it's like a completely different world. Um, so you, you, now you got these two companies and they're growing. Like what, what are some of the goals you have for your companies now? We want to, so we, um, just this year, we expanded both brands up to Utah. Mm -hmm. um, our goal right now is we need to solidify both of them. I think um, our cleaning company in Utah is growing at a really, really healthy pace. Mm -hmm. We have a great partner up there that he's just, uh, just so good. Mm -hmm. We're so blessed to have him. Um, we also have a partner that runs the pest control up there that he's extremely qualified. He's a hard worker. Um, so I think right now the, the next goal, we, we want to make sure we, we stack the markets. We want to make sure Phoenix, Arizona, we are, we're very well established. We get a good team behind us. We get a great clientele. We build that loyalty with our customers. Uh, the same in Utah. Mm -hmm. And we do have some ambitious plans to move to, uh, to a few other cities. Mm -hmm. uh, cities that I'm attached emotionally a little bit, so I like yeah. to have like, a reason to go back to those cities. Uh, but also that make a lot of sense with the economy. I think those are great places to do business. Mm -hmm. But I think in the next 12 to 24 months, our goal is to continue to grow um, each entity, mm -hmm. um, at least triple, quadruple the size, and I think we'll be very happy with that. Awesome. Um, you had mentioned that you had gone, was it a missions trip or something you did in New York? Yeah, so I did, uh, from my church, I did a, a, a missionary service. So it's pretty much like community service yeah. that, that we give to the church for uh, for two years. And I, yeah, I did that for, for two straight years. I left my home in Mexico and mm -hmm. I was relocated there. So I lived in New York City and Long Island for two years. So how does faith play into your, your life? Well, I, I think um, it, it's a big piece of it, mm -hmm. right? Mine too. And, and not just in, in, in business, but in, in my personal uh, in my personal life, they said the faith is that belief in something that you cannot see. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of, since I left Mexico, I've always uh, had the faith that things will work out. When I came to school, when I started my first job, my very first job, I used to uh, pick up uh, recycle trash. Mm -hmm. And I loved that job. I was just so grateful for it. Yeah. And uh, there were days where I just wanted to do something else, but I always knew if I can just stay with this right now, this is what I have in front of me. Um, I always knew things would work out. And um, in the last what, 15 years that I've been in the U.S., I feel a little less than 13 years that I've been in the U.S., I've learned that if I just work hard, if I try to do my very best, things will work out. So I, I think that's a, a, a manifestation of, of faith. And that has gone up and down. There's times when my faith is super strong and I'm invincible. And there's been times where either through bad decisions or tough circumstances, or the stress of the world, that faith has been through the dumps. Yeah. And it's affected me in both my personal and family mm -hmm. life, and it's affected our business, it's affected my health. Mm -hmm. But also, especially in the last six to 12 months, like I've been able to work a lot more on myself, and it's so funny and so interesting to see how directly it affects my family life, my health, my business, yeah. when I work on myself. Well, if your faith is never tested, it can never get stronger. Correct. And that's the one thing that, for me, I've been just like you, man. I've been up, down, you know. But now, like, it's, it's been strong for quite some time because I went through all those hard times and I was able to get out of them. And it's like you kind of build that muscle that, mm -hmm. just to your point, things are going to get better if I just keep going. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think that's, uh, now that you say, like, my faith has been really good for quite some time. Mm -hmm. That is something that I, I'm looking forward to. Mm -hmm. um, I read the book, uh, Atomic Habits, Yeah, which is a great book, and, and I'm excited to apply all of these principles of, you know, uh, faith and of discipline and, and do it for extended period of time. Mm -hmm. I feel like 
yeah, sure, a few months, a couple years. Mm -hmm. It's good, but I'm, I'm excited to see what what the next decade brings mm -hmm. uh, as I become a more disciplined man, as I as I learn to be more focused, as I learn um, to understand my priorities. Uh, and I think the results at the end of the next decade are going to be just amazing. Yeah. And I'm in no rush. That's something that has changed a lot in the last year for me. I used to be in a rush. Like, I just wanted to conquer the world. Mm -hmm. And I learned that I just need to take my time. Mm -hmm. It'll come. Just like everything in my life so far, things have worked out. Mm -hmm. So I just need to take a step back and uh, focus on one thing at a time, do my very best, and things will just play out. I love it. Because, I mean, that's being present. Like, being present in the yeah. day. Because, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, there are a lot of things that can take your focus. Um, and you can always be thinking about tomorrow, which is where, like, anxiety comes from for, for people and stuff. But when you can be present in the day, that's where the magic happens because you can appreciate little things. And you were talking about being grateful for the recycling job. Like, that's where you can apply, you know, gratitude in the present now because you can't be grateful for something tomorrow. You know, you can be grateful for something yesterday, but... You know, looking in the rearview mirror doesn't do you very good, but being grateful and present, man, that's that's powerful for yeah. anybody. Whether they own a business, whether they work for somebody, it doesn't really matter. But in their personal life too. And I think it brings them, uh, it brings individuals so much happiness. That's yeah. I think where a lot of the happiness comes from, being being able to live the moment, whether it be good or bad. Yeah. I've lived uh, pretty sour moments in my life, uh, whether through uh, failed business partnerships. Uh, you know, the beginning of the pandemic was just shocking for us. I was, I had all these dreams that they just got crushed within 30 days. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, like in my personal life with family, right? I, I, we've encountered like difficulties, uh, family and uh, and bad decisions. But yeah, I, I think being present that's ultimately what brings so much happiness. Even in the tough times, you can find a lot of light yeah. by being present. Yeah, I'm um, reading uh, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl right now. And I'm only about a third way, but he, I mean, the book is fascinating because obviously he's in a concentration camp. But when he's talking about his emotions and even him being present, like he's actually found some joy in there. And that's like such a hard thing to imagine. But if you can find joy in a concentration camp, yeah. I mean, you can pretty much find joy and be present doing anything. Which you, you read stories like that, um, and it's incredible to think how much, how blessed we are um, as a society, as people in this time and age, and how unhappy we are. Yeah. I just uh, recently read, uh, I'm very involved in different uh, groups for addiction recovery, mm -hmm. uh, whether through church and through uh, other uh, nonprofit groups. And one of the books that I've read to understand that better, it's called Dopamine Nation. Oh, yeah. And it's a, it's a fantastic book. I think every man, and men and women, right? But I yeah. think especially in today's world, every man should read that book. Yeah. And understand how your dopamine levels work mm -hmm. and, and why uh, we're having such a hard time right now in our lives to find happiness. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the world is designed right now to take away our happiness. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because it's so true. Like your phone, for example. I mean, people, that's, it's a dopamine hit every time yep. you open it or, you know, you're on Facebook or Instagram or any, any TikTok, whatever. But, like, that's, then you're addicted to something that is giving you dopamine right away uh, and you don't realize it. And then and it's this, these high levels of dopamine and then it crashes. Yes. So that's why we have so many people dealing with depression, dealing yep. with anxiety. Dealing you with look at everybody's highlight reel, and then you're trying to compare your life to it. Like, Correct. You know, I've heard it said many times, but if you really, people step back and think about it, it's like, that's a terrible way uh, mm -hmm. to live your life. I mean, looking at how everybody's celebrating, they don't, that's not their entire life. Correct. They, they have bad days and are, you know, tears and all this kind of stuff, and, you know, but you can't, can't do that. It's, it's all, I'll check and, the book out. And, and, I was, and, and I was such a... Um, I don't like to call myself a victim, but I, I fell into that trap, mm -hmm. right? Like the, the social media trap, the online world, mm -hmm. the uh, wanting to appear to be somebody that I, I, I probably most likely wasn't, mm -hmm. right? And just trying so hard. And it was so draining. Yeah. And it was so taxing on my health. It was so taxing on, on our business. Mm -hmm. It was so uh, taxing in, in my, the relationships that truly matter mm -hmm. because I was so worried on relationships that don't matter. Yeah. Right, so it's taking a lot of like maturity, a lot of like hard knocks to to understand that, and then, interestingly and interestingly enough, um, that has translated into a healthier, happier business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? shocking. It's huge. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that part uh, for individuals super important to understand 
um, you know, be present and understand what your priorities, uh, where your happiness truly comes from. Mm -hmm. Have you uh, ever read the book Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill? Uh -huh. It's such a fascinating book because it was written in 1938 and it wasn't released till 2011, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And it literally feels like it was written yesterday. Correct. Because the same things that, you know, he has that conversation with the devil and the thing, same kind of traps and yep. stuff or today just in different forms. In, yeah, and it's, yeah. When I read that one, like multiple times I was, re I was reading it and I would get goosebumps. Mm -hmm. I'm like, it just sounds so real. It's like you're having a conversation with the devil. Yeah. And, um, and I've seen that. I feel like I've had conversations with the devil. I've danced with the devil. Mm -hmm. and, and it's been so bad. But I've also, you know, was able to hold the hand of God and say, okay, we'll just do things right. And, yeah. and I think that piece in business, uh, it's so important. Mm -hmm. To, it, to, to be able to identify the evils that come after you and your yeah. business and, and everything and all the good I think a business is such a beautiful thing yeah. it, it's so good for people it's so good for the individuals it's good for families mm -hmm. and I think just as uh, families and individuals are under attack mm -hmm. in today's world yes. I think so are businesses mm -hmm. um, so the more we can understand that the more protected yeah. and the more understanding we can be right when you know the enemy it's easier to combat the enemy yeah and that's, uh, that's what it's all about. I should have thought of that book. When you asked me about books, because that, that's a great book. Yeah, yeah. I, I was, I never even heard of it. And I like, I, I read a lot. Yeah. And I never even heard of it until like, I don't know, three or four months ago. And I'm like, oh, I got to read this. Because I've read all of other Napoleon Hill books. And that one was just like, wow. Um, yeah, it's really good. But uh, so how, how can people find you? How can they um, get your services? Yeah, so for our services, um, Zebra.cleaning uh, on Instagram or zebracleaning.com. That's where you can find our um, home cleaning, commercial cleaning, carpet cleaning company. Uh, they're all encompassed there in one website. Just make it super easy. And then for uh, pest control is hellopandapest.com or uh, panda pest control uh, on Instagram. That's the easiest way to get a hold of us. I personally don't have any social media, mm -hmm. um, but I can be reached there or you know our team can take care of anybody looking for services. Yeah. Yeah, and I, before we go, how, how did you come up with the names? I love both names, but like, there's got to be a story behind it. Yeah, I think so. So when I started the business, I was looking for uh, a name that would be easy to remember. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make a, num uh, a, a name that would build a, a pretty solid brand that people will remember. Mm -hmm. So I have a passion for branding, so I started studying all the big companies that have a, a pretty strong brand. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to come up with a, a name that male, female, adult, kid, teenage, middle age. Uh, Hispanic, white, black, Asian person would all remember and identify with them. And I came up with Zebra. Zebra, you, you read the word and you can think of the print and it's just, you can identify very quickly to it. It's a very unique pattern mm -hmm. and it's a worldwide recognizable pattern, mm -hmm. right? So, and I also wanted to do a name that did not, was not too closely related to cleaning. Mm -hmm. So that I can have the flexibility to add other services. Yeah. So we came up with Zebra, and then the mother company of these companies, it's called Black and White Services. Mm -hmm. So then all of the um, other companies have similar names uh, to animals that are black and white. So Panda, mm -hmm. Panda Pest Control, Panda is a black and white animal. Yeah. Our commercial arm of cleaning, uh, it's called Orca Cleaning. Mm -hmm. So it's a big fish, black and white animal. So we kind of follow the pattern. I love it because. I mean, you could probably do a poll of 100 people and say, hey, do you like zebras and pandas? And probably 100 out of 100, like, yeah, unless they had, you know, got attacked by one yeah. or something or know a family member. But, yeah, it's like a universally uh, something that I think everybody finds joy in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it's in, uh, in, they all recognize it. If I show you a picture of a panda, you will say, oh, yeah, that's a panda. Yeah. Right? Uh, to where, you know, there's other names that are confusing. People, like, question them. Like, when I did my research for uh, competitors, I mean, there's names that you have no clue what the heck that is. Yeah. Right? So it's hard to remember it and stay at top of your, of your mind when you need the service if it's hard to remember. Yeah. So I wanted to have a simple name, a, a five-letter word, uh, an animal that everybody can relate to it that is not related to the service. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and I think I like it too. Yeah. I do have to say that's one of the few things that I'm very proud of in business. Like yeah. We build a really cool brand and, and people like it. Yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah. Well, thanks for your time today. Guys, I know you got a ton out of this. Uh, if you need house cleaning, you need pest control, reach out to Ishmael. He will take care of you. Actually, I know a lot of his customers, um, and I'll tell you what, they, they do a tremendous job. So uh, I know you got a lot out. Like this, comment, share it out with somebody you know who's in business, who's growing, and, and can get some good uh, nuggets from what we just talked about. So appreciate you. We'll see you next time.